Hi, my name is Mariana Glavica and I come from the Croatian Social Science Data Archive, Krozda for short. I wish a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming. This webinar is brought to you by the Coordinate Project, which is funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. Krozda is organizing this event on behalf of SESDA ERIC Research Infrastructure with support from the Slovenian Social Science Data Archives. As an introduction to today's lecture, let me first say a few words about the Coordinate Project and also take this opportunity to promote some of the other project activities that might be of benefit to you. The Coordinate Project aims to support the preparation of Europe's first cross-national accelerated bird cohort survey of child well-being named Growing Up in Digital Europe, or GUIDE. GUIDE will track children's well-being and development along with indicators of children's homes, neighborhoods, and schools across Europe. This research infrastructure will ensure harmonized research design making the results internationally comparable and highly valuable for research and the development of social policies. One of the goals of Coordinate is to improve access to existing international survey data on children and young people's well-being. Thus, the project offers opportunities for researchers to visit and gain access to international bird cohort, panel and cross-sectional survey data residing in participating countries. Applicants can apply for bursaries to cover their costs. More information about transnational visits can be found on the Coordinate website. We encourage you to apply. There will be uh, two more calls open next year. Furthermore, the project offers training on data management, face-to-face -face interactive statistical courses, summer schools, and training for non-scientific stakeholders. This aims to support the use of existing data and popularize longitudinal research in general by enhancing knowledge of methodology and statistical analysis. Please follow the events section of the project website for updates. The best way to stay informed is to subscribe to the newsletter and follow on Twitter or LinkedIn. As part of training activities, this event is organized in the form of a webinar and recordings will be publicly available later. Whether you are analyzing existing data or planning your own longitudinal study, whether you are already uh, have some experience with longitudinal research or you are starting your journey into it just now. I hope that today's lecture will spark some insights for your future work. I will now uh, shortly introduce today's lecturer, Goran Koletic, and I invite him to share his screen and to turn on his camera. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for the introduction. So, so while he's uh, sharing the screen, I I will just, uh, yeah. Do you want me to introduce you s shortly? It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's okay, I, I, can, I can do it. Okay, okay. Thank you, Goran. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your acceptance of our invitation to prepare this lecture and whenever you are ready you can begin okay thank you Maria. Thank, thank you for your introduction and for, for presenting this valuable information about coordinate project so just a few words about me i'm a this assistant professor at the department of sociology at the faculty of humanities and social sciences at the university of zagreb so the lecture i prepared for today is on methodological and analytical aspects of longitudinal research. Please have in mind that it is merely impossible to fit all the all the relevant aspects into a one one or so hour of lectures. lectures. So basically this will be a brief, a, a sort of introductionary lecture where in the first part I will cover some 
relevant aspects of longitudinal design. Then, uh, due to the fact that I was quite recently involved in one uh, large-scale longitudinal uh, study, I will present some of the shortcomings and some of the success successes we had uh, we had done. I we had experience to, we had the experience of those. So the main, may basically the main uh, the main part of the lectures will will evolve around uh, challenges and recommendations for. Uh, designing and conducting uh, conducting uh, longitudinal studies, and uh, in the final part, I will just make a brief overview of uh, how to choose how to choose your analysis. That is a huge huge part of that. So also be nearly impossible to fit in this sh short period of time. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's do further. So uh, what is basically a longitudinal design? So it is. Uh, it's a situation when it is a data collection uh, with multiple locations across time with where, where you collect data from the same entities, for example, for, from individuals. Um, to, have, to have a proper uh, longitudinal study or to call something longitudinal, you need at least three measurement occasions, three, three waves, basically. Two wave longitudinal designs should not be called longitudinal. Why? For example, there are two main main shortcomings of if you have only two waves. For first, it's difficult to dis dis distangle true change from basically from the measurement your error, which is inherent to your all measurements. And uh, the most and the second one, more more, more important one, is that it, you can't basically model various non-linear non-linear trends. And uh, we usually we usually operate in, in terms of longitudinal studies something like, like three to not ten or maybe maximum twelve waves. If you have more than that waves, maybe you're getting getting into a field of econo econometric uh, time series analysis. So where you have a multiple multiple measurement occasions for something like twenty and so on. So. Uh, for example, the the study, the research project I was involved with, involved with was uh, conducted in the population of adolescents, and one of our main main either predictor or outcome was pornography use. So, in several of these examples, I've been using, I'll be mentioning either uh, adolescents, either pornography or related to it. So, you know, in some cases, in some research fields and top the topics and the population is as well. Uh, maybe maybe the longitudinal design is the best possible one. So, for example, just to, just to illustrate, on one hand, you have the gold standard for uh, determining causality, so experimental design. But what about this topic, the topic that I was involved in? So you have two major issues. In one point, uh, research ethics are basically uh, precludes to do experiments in minors on the one hand, and the other one is more specific. So it would be quite difficult, even even in even in the age of adolescence, to find a control group, a valid control group that has not been uh, exposed to some sort of sexually explicit material. Okay, then on the on the other side, you have cross-sectional design, which allows us to de determine correlations. So as a sort of a bronze bronze standard. Then in between, basically, as a silver standard, you have longitudinal design that allows us to assess temporal effects and the developmental traje trajectories. Beside that, it also allows, allows us to assess inference of causality, basically one of the prerequisites for causality. So that's the, it, do, it doesn't help you determine causality, of course, but only an inference of causality. And, and researchers should be very careful when interpreting those uh, when interpreting uh, longitudinal results in in, in uh, terms of causality. And of course, let's not forget that we also have qualitative research methods to assess, for example, this kind of topic. So, uh, what consists the need for doing for doing or con conducting a longitudinal study? Well, first, first things first, you want to assess some temporal effects or the developmental tra trajectories. Well, that's self-explanatory. On the other hand, you might you might want to test uh, theory from a long, longitudinal perspective. For example, it's not uncommon that some of the theories that have been de developed in years years before and so that they they overlook the longitudinal components. So you want you want to add empirically empir some you want to add something empirically to the pre uh, previous or present theories, then. Also, uh, 
uh, while some some longitudinal while some cross-sectional studies for, for, in terms of cross-sectional studies, of course, causality is uh, unwarranted. Well, uh, longitudinal study might provide that already mentioned an inference of causality, which might give you which might give you uh, an, an insight whether, for example, to pursue an experimental design at, at all. If you know if there's no this prerequisite that your construct are construct A precedes the construct B. Maybe maybe the pursuing the even diff, more difficult the more difficult uh, study design actually is not needed. And of course you might what you might want to check whether the conclusions differ between, for example, your previous previous cross-sectional studies and the longitudinal studies. For example, by by uh, focusing on effect sizes, are there any differences? In effect sizes, for example, in associations between construct, constructs when they're conducted in the cross-sectional way and longitudinal way. There are some guidelines that uh, suggest that when interpreting uh, longitudinal effect sizes, that even that lower effect sizes are uh, should be considered meaningful when compared to some other effect sizes, compared to effect sizes produced by uh, cross-sectional designs. So. Basically, if you have the, if, if you have the for some of the effect size same in both of those designs, is there a, is there any kind of unique theoretical contribution by conducting a longitudinal design? But before, if even if you have even if you have the need or you have a hunch that you need a longitudinal longitudinal study, uh, it, it's also important how to how you frame your research questions or your hypothesis. So as I mentioned before. It's not uncommon that some of the theories or uh, conceptual models sometimes overlook when some effect is occurring and for how long does it last. So basically, when, while framing a, a longitudinal hypothesis, it's not enough to add uh, that A is associated, associated with B over time. That is, is not a proper, proper longitudinal hypothesis or research question. Instead, you should focus Focus on the unique changes of that construct. Of that construct, for example, when does the when does the effect when does the effect when does the change occur? Here we have think about just very simple very very simple uh, example of for example relationship satisfaction over time. So when does the change occur? When you have some sort of a drop down drop down in this relationship satisfaction and for how long uh, does that effect last and how does it change it why does it change it and more importantly uh what are the constructs or what are the factors associated associated with that change if you're talking about relationship satisfaction that might be something something like intimacy trust commitment and so on and then after that even those even those cost constructs might be might, might be time related so what is the nature? What is the nature of that association between two time varying costs construct? Do they have increasing or decreasing trend? Are those increasing or decreasing trends? Do they have a less or more substantial change over time? Of, of course, evol evol evolving around the, their association. So, a couple of these questions might might help you to frame your uh, frame your proper uh, longitudinal hypothesis instead of just you know adding that something is different or something is associated over time. The next, next important thing about longitudinal studies is the sample size. And uh, the recommendation is very simple, as large as possible, mainly due to risks of attrition, with, which will, I, I assure you, happen. Uh, so while thinking about sample size, there are just, just a few things that I want to stress. So your to total sample size is basically observations. So it's your number of subjects multiplied by the number of measurement occasions. If you, uh, within subject design designs, uh, have in mind that within subject designs, you usually have smaller error, error terms compared to cross-sectional de designs. In determining what is the adequate sample size, Power analysis helps, but in compared to compared to uh, cross sectional designs, power analysis in longitudinal designs is quite complex because it takes into account the number of subject, number of measurement occasions, what kind of growth cur curve are you uh, modeling? Is it a linear or nonlinear, and the variability of change over time. Main two, two main suggestions on that in that regard that that 
if you add more subjects to your to your study, that will reflect, of course, on between person effects. And if you add more measurement occasions, it will it will affect uh, within person effects. The next next important next important uh, aspect of longitudinal design is the measure a number of measurement occasions, number of waves you need. Well, while uh, equal spacing between those measurement measurements, let's, let, let's call them waves, between those waves is somewhat less important. For example, you're conducting your, your study that your data, data collection period lasts for three months. Of course, that the person who is who is recruited at the beginning of that period has a three to three months lag to the person to the person to the individual or, or a participant at the end of the recruitment phase so in, in those terms uh, equal spacing in some in some fields and in some topics might be less important but on the other hand and the number of time points uh, the number of time or time points or the number of waves is quite more important it's important that you have uh, it, 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 it is important that you have enough of them that you can actually uh, catch the change that you're aiming for. So here's a simple, simple illustration. So you have a job satisfaction measured, measured over a course of 12 months. So you have several possible for possible assessments. Let's say you're measuring measuring only a job satisfaction in, in the first month and the 12th month. Then you're detecting a declining linear trend. If you're measuring in in the first, sixth, and twelfth months, then you're able to. Those are those three waves that const constitute the constitute uh, longitudinal design. Then you have the ability to detect non-linearity, non non which is present in this example. Then, if you only if you only take a chunk of it, only first chunk of three months, and you analyze that, you're going to over under, overestimate negative slope. As you see, it is steeper in the first the first three months. But on the other hand, if you if you assess on the last three months, you're going to uh, underestimate negative slope because it's, it, is, it, is, it is basically plateauing. Regarding some basic guidelines for number of measurement occasions, and of course, uh, space in between those measurement occasions. Well, review the literature or uh, if, if possible, observe if there is any kind of, let's call it a natural dynamic of, of occurrence if, in, in, in your uh, topic of measurement. Or conduct interviews, interviews and observations with relevant subjects. So basically, number of waves and uh, time lags extremely differ from from top, basically from topic to topic. Okay. Uh, now we're going to talk about challenges. Actually, we're going to uh, delve into the main part, main part of this lecture. So. Uh, we can divide challenges in basically in three parts. First are the lo logistic ones. So you're aware that the, the conducting longitudinal design is time consuming, dependent on the number of waves and time lags you're having. So uh, the recruitment due to the attrition uh, all, always almost always uh, requires larger baseline baseline sample samples. Uh, if you're, for example, uh, Trying to, if you are recruiting someone from schools or from other educational institu institutions or so on, you have to keep keep in mind that all those accesses to participants might have gate gatekeepers. For example, like school principals, if you're doing uh, if you're recruiting uh, pu pupils or high school students, and then you'll also have to uh, think about motivating participants, particularly if you're doing, conducting an online study. We have uh, talk about a little bit more about incentives later on. Then you, then you have met methodological uh, challenges. Well, the main one is basically attrition. That you have to, the, 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 it is very important that you at least at least have some some insight into the reasons why are you losing participants? Because in the end, that might that might produce specific bias that of course will affect your results, or either the interpreta interpretation of your results. The attrition might differ whether you conduct your study online or classroom-based, or based, or maybe using a uh, com commercial panel that also has the has the capabilities to track the same participants over several measurement occasions. The one thing that uh, that uh, participants will get is that familiarity with your questions and your measurement instruments, because it might be it might be the case that you're going to repeat some of your measures. For, uh, throughout the throughout the waves, 
one of the challenges is also to how to uh, con initially contact and then recontact -re your uh, your participants, partic uh, particularly if, if you're doing an online online survey, and how what are the means or what are the modes modalities of linking those surveys. In terms of online online, uh, because you have to have some sort of context that that uh, is related then to uh, the importance of the sharing anonymity. And on the other hand, if you're, for example, uh, doing a paper pen data collection in schools, then you have to have a means of assuring privacy in the classrooms and so on. And finally, finally of course, uh, uh, conducting logical design, it lasts so long. You, it's, not, it's not uncommon that you'll need a research team, that you can't actually do everything on your own, and that those... Uh, uh, those those, uh, those uh, that kind of conducting can be quite expensive. So, uh, just a few words about the project that I was involved in. Uh, then I'm going to using using that project in our experience. I'm going to um, suggest various various recommendations, and I'm going to talk about about the uh, things that we uh, didn't do quite well, some of our shortcomings, some of the things that we learned on the way. Some of the things that we, if we were conducting this study one more time, that we would, we will do completely different, and so on. So this is a four-year four-year longitudinal study on adolescents aged 16, 16 or above. So uh, mainly involved about uh, sexual explicit material, like pornography use, and various aspects of their uh, psychosocial, uh, psychosocial well-being. So uh, we had a bunch of collaborators. Uh, you see the, a bunch of topics that we. That we delved into, and finally, the, the whole project resulted with some, with uh, forty published papers based on the data we have. Just a little few more de details about the data and what actually happened, and how the uh, and how the the study was going on. So we we our onset was in uh, spring two thousand fifteen. We st we were planning to do an online recruitment, online data collection using leaflet recruitment. Leaflets would be uh, spread around schools by our uh, students and we were planning to have lottery-based incentives. So we were planning six waves with six six waves in between. Then uh, we started everything, and uh, at first wave, for first wave, everything went well. As you see, we had uh, more than two thousand participants. But please, I highlighted here what happened in the uh, when we when we reached the second wave. The second wave, we had a huge huge. Uh, it's a huge dropout from our sample, and we got panicked, we seriously panicked. So we were trying to we, we tried to find a solution for that, and the solution was quite a difficult one. But actually, it worked in the end. Uh, we uh, the, the same year in winter we uh, conduct we started conducting a classroom based uh, data collection with the paper pen questionnaires in a smaller smaller urban city in Croatia, also planning to do six waves with basically the same time lag in between, but we haven't been using incentives because this is something we were doing on our own. This was not funded by our, our National National Science Foundation, so no incentives involved for that arm of the study. Uh, but the thing is, as, as you can see, that uh, the, although the baseline sample in Rijeka was smaller, it uh, tended to be quite stable throughout time. So of course there was a dropout, there was some attrition, which was which was something that we expected, but we didn't have this this chaos basically that we that happened between the first and the second wave in our Zagreb study. So uh what are the recommendations? What we have learned and what what are, what can I share with you now? So one thing, okay, obtaining approvals. It's uh, something that you see that you basically need to do long before the data collection. It's a bit about those gatekeepers you need to announce, for example, the school principals, that you're going to visit them for a several several times, that you need their help, either either to uh, either to uh, help from the from the school staff to help you to help you organize when you will visit the classrooms either to do the data collection or just to, for example, to remind or announce your next online data collection wave. Another thing that was quite that we uh, did was develop developing a visual ident identity for our project. It needs to be something hip, catchy, simple. And uh, of course, it's it's always good to uh, have some design designer or some some of those those sets of skills to help you 
help you with that. And of course, we were uh, acquiring free feedbacks from selected uh, high school students to, to to tell us what did, what do they think about our visual identity and how are we how are we going to present ourselves as a project as researchers uh, to our future participants. Yeah, uh, on that note, we also decided to develop, of course, li li uh, recruitment leaf leaf leaflets with all the necessary information. But also, uh, we did we did a small uh, YouTube tutorial by uh, by having two young creation actors uh, basically basically explaining what is the procedure, how do they register, uh, what are the incentives, why are we doing that? Because you know, uh, things, kids tend uh, kids tend to uh, like video materials more than uh, in, in huge chunks of text, of course. Uh, then uh, we set up the registration site uh, and social media sites for that. Since for that study, we were using only Facebook because Facebook was quite pop popular among youngsters at a the time. Then we decided uh, after after discussion with some of the high school students what are, what are our what are is what, what are our incentives going to look like so we, we decided to have a lottery lottery based incentive and uh, as you can see here is the here is the uh, the percentage of collect, collected collected uh, it, it was it, it was a lottery based incentive we were giving away shopping mall gift cards at an amount of uh, I think it was something like 10 10 euros today's today's currency uh so as you can see uh not many not not, not many lottery gift cards were collected at the first wave but then when when our when our particip participation is uh, subsequently uh, in, the, in the following waves stabilized the the percentage of collected collective gift cards increased and, and remained stable the other thing was that we need to assure confidentiality, confidentiality, and uh, confidentiality for our participants. So we use the we use the separate database for contacts for their emails that was provided provided through the registration website, and a separate separate database for uh, uh, questionnaire data. There is also, of course, a database that was linking those those two, that was linking the contacts with the unique codes that were pro that were provided via leaflets. And the thing is that we uh, one of the, one of the team members was a uh, uh, was a co colleague who's actually only involved in handling our databases. So we, as a researchers, never actually had had the opportunity or the need, basically, uh, to see what does the contact database look like. So that was that was everything everything that was handled by him. And when we when we finalized the, the recruitment, when we uh, finished our uh, data collection, uh, he raised he raised the uh, the database with the context. So the only thing that remained was the database with the unique codes and the questionnaire data. Of course, the, the thing that we needed most. So uh, I mentioned that I'm going to talk about incentives. So of course, in the incentives need to incentives have have to be in the amount to show. Uh, respect for participants' time and effort. So either it's money, gift cards, food vouchers, uh, school supplies, telephones. It really depends on the population you're aiming for. But uh, determining and in determining adequate incentives, there are many factors that uh, will aff affect that type of incentive. So either it could be either by study budget or standard of living in a country, population of issues or interest, or for example, in our case, institutional or governmental policies. policies. So we were not allowed, we were not allowed to have monetary uh, monetary gifts, uh, monetary incentives for our participants. That's why we were using gift cards from a particular shopping mall. Of course, of course, some institutions even uh, even pre even prescribe what is the high uh, highest amount of in incentive that can be given away given away to participants. And finally, there are different models. Th th these models tend to, uh, tend to be also linked to the budget you have. For example, we our budget wasn't wasn't large enough to incentivize each participant, but there is that that is a possibility. For example, I'm do doing a project now where I can incentivize each participant, which is wonderful. Then there is also there is a model then where you can uh, uh, incentivize each participant, then give an, an, an extra an extra incentive for each following wave of particip participation. So basically encouraging them to continue because every other wave will bring them more funds. 
uh, there is a, a model of one 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 prize lottery, so one huge prize, and then you have a lottery or a horizontal lottery. That is something that we use. So we have you have a number of uh, a number of awards, but with the same with the same incentive amount or pyramid or, or a model of pyramid lottery where you have also a number a number of various uh, awards. For for example, various gift gift cards, but the 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 monetary amount for each gift gift card uh, differs. So you have something like I don't know, fifty euros, three of them, ten euros, twenty of them, and so on. The most important thing is to acquire feedback, and even even if even, sometimes feedback is it's not it's not enough to talk to talk with several of your with several members of your key population before you start conducting your research. You should you should acquire fee, feedback during the during the data collection so uh just to just to, just to return to our recommendations of course i mentioned i mentioned in the in the uh, in the previous slide that you need a field, field workforce so we had our students that, 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 that helped us recruit uh, recruit uh, high, high high school students actually disseminate all those uh leaflet leaflet recruitments and then you also had to you also have to prepare it is a Proper suggestion that you have to prepare various tracking forms, various Excel spreadsheets to track and coordinating and contacting either your field workforce or your gatekeepers to track the number of your participants and so on. And here I would like to stress one particular particularly important uh, tracking tool. It's also something something that is one of our shortcomings uh, in, in the study. So. In both in both uh, cities in Zagreb and in Rijeka, so we were planning our measures uh, before each wave, uh, which is which is fine, of course. But the, the the better thing is 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 that if you know that you're going to conduct, for example, four or six waves of study, to plan all of your measures upfront related to the all the uh, hypotheses or research questions you want to want to assess. I know that's that's a lot of work. Even having in mind what has to be done before initiating the study, thinking about all of the papers, all of the research questions you want to conduct, uh, you want to you want to assess or examine with your longitudinal data before it even starts is is a, is a serious amount of work. But I really seriously encourage because the, the, what might happen if you if you do it like we did. So planning our planning our measures bit, just before each wave and adding them. The, the the thing is that you have some time varying time varying measures and time invarying measures, and in the end, when we collected all of our all of our uh, all of our data from all of our six waves, we were planning to do some hypothesis, to do some modeling. Then we realized that we don't have, for example, enough measures of some constructs. We have, for example, only we we measured it only uh, twice. We wanted to do a mediation analysis. We needed we needed three waves of that measure. That happened because you know the idea the idea idea for that hypothesis came after we after that we after we, uh, the data collection was finished. So there was no turning back. So we knew okay this is we 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 asked about this thing for example uh, two times and basically we can't do anything anything with that. So. It's always to it's always good to to sum up. It's always good to divide your measures into time varying, time invariant, and and spread them across all of your planned waves uh, according to your uh, research needs, to your research questions, and to your hypothesis. And that kind of that kind of Excel spreadsheets might uh, might do uh, might be very handy just to visualize everything. What 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 measures you have and what measures could be included in the uh, following waves. Uh, if so, now we are in period of during data collection. So, if you are doing data collection in classroom in the classrooms, especially if you are doing something on the sensitive to topics, it's encouraging to it's actually imperative to use privacy panels to very simple very simple cardboard pa panels to make a basically to make a small voting booth for each student so that that he or she has a privacy while uh, filling out the questionnaire. The other thing that uh, you need to have in mind in uh, classroom-based data collection is how we how will you code your your uh, how will you code your questionnaires 
and how you link them across waves. For example, so this, the, the, the instructions are written in Croatia, but I will explain. So we're using a very simple code. So five, uh, five, alpha, five uh, numeric, uh, alphanumeric uh, code with f five digits. So it was with a starting letter of your father's name. Start, start, like this, sorry. Okay, so it, it was a star, starting uh, starting letter of your father's name, starting letter of your mother's name, only the only the date of your birth. So just the day, not the month, and adding if you're a male or female, and uh, that 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 had that was enough the, that had enough discriminatory power that to uh, differentiate students within a classroom. At least we thought it, it was until we. Uh, we, we stumbled upon several several classrooms in several schools that had twins in the same classroom. So this this kind this kind of uh, coding system was pointless because we couldn't figure out who is who when we were linking linking the uh, linking the questionnaires in the subsequent waves. The other issue is that uh, all of all of these instructions and these coding it seems very simple your participants will make mistake and you will have issues linking your questionnaires from wave to wave to wave either by either they're going to do it uh, either by mistake write in the month instead of a day of their birth switch the mother's or father's name or which is also very likely they will do it on purpose and and, and of course you, you'll have a bunch of questionnaires unlinkable questionnaires in your data set so let's go further. Response tracking. So very, very important, very important aspects as well. So uh, if you're doing an online online data collection and you're using emails to remind and invite your participants, you have to have in mind that, for example, minors or adolescents or high schoolers, they don't see an email, email something as important as, as, for example, we do. They're using social social media to communicate and so on. So it might be the thing that they're rarely checking emails, changing their emails, or they did use some other email when they were registering. So they're not, you know, uh, they're not following following your announcements and your reminders. Uh, on, a, on a graph before, on the graph before, you can uh, you can see what is the effect that was our response floor for third wave in Zagreb. You can see that the the spikes were usually re related to either the announcement of on facebook facebook reminders or reminders via mail and so on so reminding basically works um beside tracking tra tracking your response rate from the com uh, from uh be behind the scene you also have to be in front of the scene uh by maintaining communication with your participants so uh, we found that the repeated in-person visits to school, uh, either we were we were doing doing online online surveying in Zagreb, we noticed that we have to send our students back to the schools, back to the same classrooms to in person in, to to remind uh, our participants that the next wave will start in something like a week. So we were also using using social media to uh, post some interesting, very simple and interesting or funny results from the study, just to just to you know start engaging communication and actually to have some content on our on our uh, social media. And we also, of course, we were using both social media and emails for announcements and reminders when when our data collection period was on. Uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, okay, this in-person uh, in-person visits. So uh, I want to stress stress that here, for example, just 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 to show an, an example. So uh, at our second wave and a third wave, the mean uh, average response rate was thirty-two and forty-nine percent for for the schools that we were visiting, that our student our our field for, for, force was visiting. In comparison to that. Uh, slight, uh, a lot, a lot lower response rate rate occurred when uh, in schools that weren't visit, visited by our field workforce, by our, uh, by our students. So this in-person effect is is uh, visible when you're visiting or not visiting your participants during or at least before your data collection period. 
The next thing is qualitative feedback, basically focus groups and interviews about the intention to drop out, about satisfaction with in in incentives and so on. Uh, we were doing that before and we were doing that dur during our data collection period, dur during our waves and so on. Uh, mainly, mainly uh, to to see how we can uh, amend uh, am amend the issues we have with att attrition. So, for example, for example, some of the suggestions, some of the suggestions we got uh, can be implemented. Implemented that we need to uh, do the questionnaire, do the questionnaires during uh, during class in the schools. Or uh, that prices were not particularly motivating. That we need to change change the maybe maybe the lottery model and so on. Of course, some of the suggestions can't be implemented, so we can't make boys more mature, or we can't add more dirty questions to our questionnaire to make to make it more fun and appealing to some of the students. But uh, nonetheless, this this kind of feedback, even before and during the, during the data collection is really, really helpful, and it was really helpful for us. Uh, finally, this, this is something that you can do also during and after data collection is uh, track your uh, track your sampling flow. So you, here you can see a, this huge Excel sheet that has uh, our uh, online data from Zagreb for six waves and uh, classroom-based data from Bianca for six waves, and also various combinations of participants. So participants that were uh, that were participating only in first and third wave, first, second, third wave, and so on. So it's actually a very, very important piece of spreadsheet because when you link linked it with uh, the other the other uh, spreadsheet that was mentioned, I mentioned that was important. The one, the one that uh, in which you have all of your measures measures uh, posted, all of your me measures mentioned, which 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 indicator or which construct are you measuring at which wave then you can see okay is this is this link is this relation is this association is this this uh, hypothesis feasible because i do have the measures but let's see do, do i have do i have enough participants participants plus uh measurement occasions that is do, do i have number number of uh, big enough big enough uh amount of observation to assess that kind of hypothesis. As I mentioned, for example, this the, that uh, some of the students that while we were using that uh, uh, that coding to link the questionnaires, of course, some of the students in high school deliber de deliberately uh, made wrong uh, wrong inputs for in those uh, those little boxes for those coding. So that's something we called unique. So we had it in each wave. It basically basically unlinked questionnaires. We couldn't we couldn't we couldn't find out which questionnaire was linked to which other in the previous wave. So the or, the or the subsequent waves. So a little bit more about the attrition. So uh, we were asking ourselves because we knew we have uh, issue with attrition. We were asking ourselves uh, ourselves. Okay. Besides the basic fact, who uh, who are the participants that are uh, less likely to participate participate in following ways? But besides that, we were asking ourselves: uh, Are we maybe losing the most relevant participants first? Though of course, that can be that can be an issue uh, in very, for various analytical reasons and so on. So. Uh, after we completed our both of our data collections in both of the, both, both of cities, we we did an analysis and published it about uh, about uh, vulnerable particularly vulnerable participants and attrition. So basically, what we were asking uh, asking ourselves were uh, participants that were particularly vulnerable to pornography use according to set of indicate relevant indicators. Were they more li likely to drop out to be lost to follow up participants? Because if if uh, if they are, uh, we need to we, we need to rethink majority of our main findings that, for example, assess negative negative effects of pornography use on various aspects of uh, youth's life. So we were using both panels, either the online panel and the uh, uh, classroom based panel. And we were also trying to see if there is a if there is a um, difference the difference based on the data collection mode. 
So what we found out that uh, at first, first we detected that, that we have basically three types of attrition. So it was attrition, early attrition, later attrition, and particip participation gaps. So and the results the results show that uh, uh, the early attrition was substantially higher among vulnerable uh, participants compared to other participants, and that there is a difference between uh, data collection modes, that vulnerable vulnerable participants, uh, there was a uh, vulnerable participants produced participation, they were, they were missing out some of the uh, data recruitment, the, the data collection waves, only in classroom, only in classrooms, not in an online study. But to some some of those results, we do we we we, we do believe that uh, that adolescents that adolescents uh, are, that are under risk of ad adverse outcomes associated with pornography were less likely to complete all of the all of the waves in our study, and that's something that 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 kind of analysis is something that I would encourage you to do as well. So not just seeing what kind of attrition you have, but seeing are you basically lo uh, losing your uh, mo most vulnerable or most important types or, or subgroups of your participants. So based on that based on that experience, we uh, recommend several things. So of course, modality of data collection it differs if if it's the classroom based or online. You know you need to, you need to have uh, resources for a large baseline sample. And also think about besides instead of using online data collection platforms, are the for example, cell phone applications more more efficient to reduce attrition. Uh, for attrition, you need to be prepared either by having your questionnaire short, of course, uh, uh, doing doing a visual identity for your study, having desirable uh, uh, desirable incentives, and conducting fo focus groups about about potential attrition. And how to delay, not even to prevent, but if you, you you know you know you're going to have some sort of attrition, but how to delay that attrition. So it's of course it's reminding your participants, it's communicating with them with, for example, interesting findings, adding or modifying incentives, or for example, having having your little agents within your peer groups, having particularly motivated, and then of course incentivize. Participants who would encourage other other participants, other peers to continue to participate. This is a brief brief tour into small analytical part. A very simple way to assess, a very simple way to assess your attrition. So, just for for example, you are assessing attrition from first two waves of your study, from T1, time one, and time two. In time one baseline, you have 100 students, and in 100 participants, and in time two, you have 75. So, 25 are are lost to follow up. So, but just by using binary logistic regression analysis, you want to answer the question: Which participants have higher odds for dropping out? You simply use your data from T1. You code your uh, participant. You, you, co you co code your uh, dependent variable into two groups. So, for example, zero is participants that participated in the subsequent waves, but in the one and uh, the other code for the dichotomous DV is the ones that were lost to follow up. And you add all the and you add all the relevant relevant characteristics that might have that might inform you about the form, uh, way of I mean the the the, the way the, the mode of uh, attrition you have related to your participants' characteristics. In other words, which participants, which type or subgroup of participant is more likely to drop up, for example, in the next wave. And of course, this kind of an analysis you can repeat in each sub subsequent wave just to have just to have you know a clear clear uh, clear even even before you finish your final wave that you have a clear clear vision of your okay what's happening what 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 is what what kind of attrition I have okay uh, the next topic is actually the final topic and I'll be very brief regarding this is choosing an, uh, an analysis framework so just recently there is uh, this this paper was published. A journal of our developmental cognitive neuroscience, but disregard the topic. It's actually a very good, very good uh, premier uh, premier uh, gu guidelining paper with you know uh, small decisions, small decisions trees, trees. How to choose your uh, cho how to choose your analysis framework, your uh, analytic approach. 
I uh, did very simple. I will, I, uh, will pre present a very simple way. I actually, I will pre present two uh, two modeling framers frameworks, and I I believe I do have time for one example from the structural equation modeling, and that's about it. That's that's the most I could fit in this in this lecture. So basically, you'll find that there are two general general modeling frameworks. One is uh, multi-level, sometimes called mixed effects modeling or hierarchical modeling. So there are some spe specific advantages of those. For example, uh, multi-level modeling allows you to estimate higher levels of nesting. So in, in multi-level modeling, longitudinal multi-level modeling, you basically basically have two levels. So the first level are your uh, uh, measurement uh, measurement occasions, your waves. And on the second levels are individuals in which those measurement occasions are nested in. So, but you can go beyond the individual, and then you can have, for example, schools or classrooms or schools or some higher order, higher order measurement. So beyond the individual, the the, the main thing is that of course the the, the uh, repeated measurements are on the lowest level. Uh, uh, Multi-level modeling is somewhat limited in respect to measurement error in your uh, variables of interest because you have to include them as either as manifest variables or as the composite composite measures that's something something structural equation modeling deals a little bit better uh, but on the other hand you have uh, an opportunity for a very simple inclusion of very various time varying or time invarying invarying co uh, co covariates so time varying like for example here is the relationship satisfaction mentioned or time invarying uh, like, for example, gender, uh, and the final thing is that uh, compared compared to uh, structural equation modeling, modeling, you can only assess relative fit for your multi level multi level models. That is, you can compare similar model, you can compare compare fit of the similar models. You don't have an absolute absolute fit to how that how how well does your your data represent represent the model you have. On the other hand, as another as, as a second general modeling framework is already mentioned structural equation modeling. So in this case, you have uh, repeated measures as uh, latent factors. So okay, of course they can be as uh, manifest variables in the model, but you have the opportunity to to include include uh, latent latent constructs, which as a result allow you to control the uh, effect of measurement errors in your variables of interest, so either predictors or either out outcomes. Uh, compared to multi-level modeling, here you have uh, opportunity to test to, to 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 check your absolute model fit by using several of several of different fit indices like the CFI, so it's compared to fit indexes or Tucker Lewis index index and so on. There are many of them and. Uh, Structural equation modeling is particularly suitable, suitable if you're planning to do some sort of longitudinal mediation, mediational analysis, much, much more suited, suitable than, for example, multi-level. But uh, to, start, to sum up similarities between bo both of those uh, modeling, modeling frameworks actually outweigh their, uh, their, their differences. In some in some instances, in, for some research questions, you basically could you could basically get the same results from the multi-level modeling and from the structural equation modeling. Of course, there are some considerations that might turn your decision or need or necessity towards one or another. Uh, some of those are, of course, your research question and hypothesis. Then your variable type. Either you have, for example, for your dependent variable, do you have a categorical variable, the dichotomous or, or uh, a classical nominal nominal variable, or you have a continuous quantitative variable, and so on. Do you do you have you do you do you have your variables only in its manifest form, or do you have a latent latent, latent construct that you want to include in your, in your models? Uh, there is also an issue of number of covariates. Much more easier to add more more uh, greater number of covariates in multi-level modeling. It works as a regression than. Uh, than in a, in a structural equation modeling. So there's a thing about uh, your covariates. Are they time variant or time invariant? Uh, both, of, both of time variant and time invariant covariates can be included in both of those frameworks. 
the issue of balanced or unbalanced or the level of balance balancedness of your data uh, meaning that uh, are your measurement equally spaced on the one hand and do you have maybe missing data for example for example structural equation modeling by using uh, full information maximum likelihood estimator one of many actually handles the issue of missing data missing data quite quite well so uh, when i say missing data i really mean missing data in, from the participant from the participants uh from the participants that uh, that participated in a particular particular wave not the missing missingness that was produced by the attrition so th those are two different things uh, then there is the type of change you want to model. So is it linear, is it non-linear, and so on. What is the what is the curve growth curve you're aiming at? Uh, are you uh, are you planning to, to to assess any kind of higher order nesting? Yes, you can do that with multi-level modeling. Of course, there's there's this hybrid of multi-level structural equation modeling, combining the best of two worlds. But when thinking about combining the best of two worlds or the least of two worlds, the least of two worlds, you have to think which, which software are going to use. So uh, softwares vary. For example, some of some of the softwares that uh, have the modules to assess longitudinal data might not have, might not have the estimators that you need because, for example, your dependent variable is dichotomous or something like that. Or basically, you are maybe acquainted acquainted with some of the software, some of the not, some some not. So you have to have in mind which which statistical package you're going to use to assess your data. So now I'm going to uh, slowly go to, towards the end of the presentation. So I'm I choose I cho I've chosen uh, one uh, one example of analysis. So from the same from the structural equation modeling framework. So it's latent growth curve modeling uh, used very often. So basically it enable, enable, enables an examination of between person difference over time, of course, by estimating within person latent trajectories of change. In other words, if you have several, if you have several measures, you are you're if you have several, if you have several me several me measures on several occasions, then you uh, will get you, you, uh, the uh, latent growth curve modeling will produce a latent intercept, which will represent the initial level of measure, measured measured construct and a latent slope. Of course, measured constructs or construct over time. This might sound this might sound a bit uh, abstract. So let me show you just a brief example. So. If, Imagine this, you have relationship satisfaction measured at six measurement points. So each uh, each line represents an individual trajectory. Here are linear, but not, not they don't have to be linear. So each uh, each participant has its intercept and has its slope, of course. So that's, a, as I mentioned, latent growth, 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 growth curve modeling generates a latent intercept and a latent slope. Which is shown in a next slide. So, if you want to estimate between person differences, but taking into account account within person change, then a latent curve curve will be generated, which of course doesn't have to be doesn't have to be linear as well. That latent curve has its mean intercept, but also it has its intercept variance. It has its mean slope and it has its slope variance, and by that you basically. You basically get a model like this, but uh, so uh, in sh in short, this 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 regard many of these numbers and so on. I just want to show you this is the very basically quite quite simple model in in, in a way that has only two construct construct constructs measured over time. So it was uh, some that sexually explicit material. So it's born sexually explicit material real realism. So uh, over time, so it has its latent latent intercept and latent slope, and it it has uh, pornography use over time. So it's measured measured over three three waves. Both of the both of the constructs are measured over three waves, and uh, for pornography use, it is also uh, it also generated an intercept and a slope. Then you can on that uh, on that basic dual domain model. So it has the par parallel estimation of two constructs you can add variety of variety of uh, 
covariates. For example, this is one uh, one time invariant covariate. So it was the age age of first pornography use among participants, or for example, some trait like sensation seeking that was measured three times. So that was a uh, time varying covariate. The, ben the benefits, the advantages of this uh, of, of this approach is that you can assess multiple constructs simultaneously. For example, for realism and the pornography was shown, shown here on the, uh, on the example. It can handle unequally spelled uh, space measurement occasions and uh, nonlinear trajectories and partially missing data. As a reminder, it is the it is the structural equation modeling framework, so it uses full information ma maximum likelihood, so you don't have to worry a lot about your missing data. Although, maybe a thing that I forgot to mention before, uh, it is preferred that your data in your data set is uh, missing completely at random or missing at random, that you don't have a kind of systematic missingness in, in your data. For example, it's like a sort of sort of systematic missingness. Missingness in your data might be the attrition because you know it's it's uh, not not in, in random within one wave. And uh, finally, finally, just as a way uh, to, to just to, to, to illustrate the the, the uh, diversity of potential interpretations. So you have to you have two constructs. Uh, you have for each construct you have a slope and you have uh, intercept, and those two constructs, construct A and construct B, can are correlated in one way or another, are either positively correlated or negatively correlated. So, for example, if you see that in, in your construct A on a descriptive level you have an increasing trend, and in your construct B you have an increasing, also increasing trend. And if you find in the, between those two slopes a positive correlation, then you will say that the higher increase in construct A has the, uh, results in a more substantial, more substantial. This is important increase in the construct B, and so on. And you have uh, various combinations between uh, inter interpreting correlations between two slopes. So between two, basically between between two changes. Of course, you can uh, uh, you can also interpret the. Uh, begin, uh, the starting point at one construct, construct for example, the inter intercept, so the intercept is the mean at the baseline compared to the growth. For example, if you have, let's, let's go back to this table, so if you have increasing, increasing trend in your construct B and you have a positive correlation with the uh, intercept of construct A, you would say that the higher the baseline assessment of construct A, the more substantial increase in construct B. So, uh, and everything, and you can reflect everything that to uh, negative, negative correlations. So, if you, yeah, if you will really, use, uh, if you're planning to use or will use latent graph model modeling, I hope this sum up of how to interpret various correlations between two, between two, uh, two constructs, either slopes, slopes or intercept, will be helpful to you. So basically, uh, I would like to finish now with uh, this chapter and maybe just to mention a, a short, short, few, few thoughts as a final remark. So you probably you probably have noticed or seen or even written this uh, common statement, let's call it a mantra in research papers that more longitudinal research is needed. I know I did, I wrote it several times. But most of the times I know I wrote it because uh, it, 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 it was in fashion. I wasn't actually thinking a lot about uh, what is the time and effort and costs on the one side for conducting a longitudinal, uh, longitudinal uh, study, having in mind all of the challenges I've mentioned before, and whether that will produce a sound empirical either or theoretical contribution. So we do tend to we do tend to say yes, yes, yes. We do need to we, we do need more longitudinal studies, but we do need more longitudinal, longitudinal well conducted longitudinal studies according to the best possible guidelines that will uh, that will in the end make a certain uh, empirical or the theoretical contribution. Even well conducted, well even well conducted longitudinal studies that basically confirm the things that we already know know by our previous cross sectional uh, cross sectional data cross sectional studies might be a, a, 
either time or effort or cost waste or all three of those. So in uh, just just as a uh, final remark, so when planning when planning longitudinal data, plan well. Uh, because yeah, it, it lasts a lot, it's difficult and it costs a lot. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, at the very end, because because this presentation will be part of the recording as well, at the very end you have uh, uh, some literature among, 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 among which I want to point out the uh, McCormick's paper with the guidelines for choosing an analytical framework, it, the topic I wasn't able to you know, delve into more detail for this for this presentation for this lecture. So thank you. For more information, visit www.coordinate-network.eu.